Pulling down toward the planet, could the probe endure such a drastic deceleration? Crashing into the Jupiter atmosphere at that speed would resemble this kind of impact. Would the craft survive? Would the sensors operate? Would the data get back to the orbiter? December 7th, 1995. In the conference room, scientists from all over America come together to learn the fate of the mission. The atmospheric probe was transmitting. Things were looking up. Oh, this is stunning. This is a testimony to the ingenuity of the brilliant scientists and engineers that have worked on this program. The little probe made the most spectacular kamikaze dive in history. At four minutes in, the probe reaches the visible cloud tops. For the next 90 miles, unimaginable extremes. Freezing cold, severe winds, increasing temperature, and pressure and turbulence unknown on Earth. The plunge is all over in 57 minutes. Like an ice cube in a furnace, it melts. The scientists are elated. What we learned today was that the probe survived entry and data is on board the orbiter to tell us about Jupiter, data we, we've never collected before. The probe measured uh, the winds, measured the uh, chemical constituent, measured water, uh, searched for lightning, and measured the amount of light as the probe descended into the uh, atmosphere. And we found that the winds, which at high altitude on Jupiter are very, very strong, 300 miles an hour, those winds don't die off as you get deep in the atmosphere. They, in fact, get a little stronger, if anything. That's one of the things that that tells you is that the atmosphere of Jupiter is being uh, driven from its fundamental energy sources by energy from within Jupiter, not just from absorbed uh, solar energy at the very top skin of the atmosphere. We expected that water would be the uh, third most abundant molecule in the atmosphere after hydrogen and helium. In fact, the probe found uh, about five times less water than we expected. And that could either be because Jupiter is a dry planet or because the probe hit a dry spot. But then, of course, uh, the question is, why should uh, that dry spot persist in spite of all the mixing and activity that's going on in the atmosphere? New research indicates the probe did hit an isolated dry area, or hotspot, as first postulated. Scientists believe these hotspots can occur where up and down winds combine with large-scale air pressure differences, creating a pocket of dried out air. These pockets, or hotspots, tend to be about the size of North America. But there's still a lot more to be learned. The Galileo spacecraft has slotted into orbit around Jupiter, aligning itself for the main part of its mission. Galileo searched the upper atmosphere for any signs of the Shoemaker-Levy impact, but all traces had vanished. Perhaps the evidence was swept away in the turbulent atmosphere, the swirling storms and cyclones of frozen ammonia. More proof from Galileo of a dynamic atmosphere. Encircling Jupiter are very faint rings. Invisible from Earth, they're overwhelmed by the light of Jupiter. It's like trying to see a candle against the beam of a searchlight. The only way they could be glimpsed is if you were hovering near the clouds. The best time to view them is when they are backlit by the sun, which is how Galileo captured them. The one major ring measures a few thousand miles across and seems to be made from trillions of tiny dust grains as fine as cigarette smoke. Particles from constant collisions are thought to keep the ring replenished. Flanked on either side is a halo ring inside the main ring, 
and a much fainter gossamer ring on the outside. Galileo got its fill of the rings and then moved on to explore the rest of Jupiter's neighborhood. December 1995, Galileo is flung out 12 million miles, but Jupiter's gravity pulls it back and then guides it on the tour through the moons. With each new orbit, the craft would offer new insights. The Voyager explorations in, in 1979 showed us uh, remarkably that each one of these moons had its own character. They very quickly became like sort of old friends to those of us studying them. Each one had a different face, looked like it had gone through a different history, been beat up in different ways. And we're going to want to see what those things look like when Galileo flies 350 times closer than the Voyagers did. The pictures Galileo sent back were worth the wait. Images of moons never before seen in close-up. Callisto is the most distant of Jupiter's moons. It's also got probably the most cratered and the most ancient surface in all of the solar system. Just one look at Callisto and all you see are craters. Craters from tiny pits to things like this, 10, 20, 30, 50 miles across. This is the center of a huge impact that would have occurred eons ago. It radiates outwards in concentric rings out to a diameter of about 1,000 miles. Galileo saw how Callisto was paying a penalty for being so close to Jupiter. The gassy sphere, with its powerful gravity, sucks in any passing comet or asteroid that strays too close. Callisto is often in the way. Taken during Galileo's 30th orbit of the planet in 2001, these new images of Callisto's surface, opposite an area that sustained a major collision, show no signs of the impact. This fuels a theory that Callisto houses an underground ocean acting like an internal shock absorber. In contrast, Europa showed a face completely unlike Callisto's. Europa's lack of craters suggests a young surface made up of fresh material. The most intriguing thing about Europa are the series of thousands of lines that crisscross its surface, rather like a whole highway system. From uh, the shots of Voyager and from far away in Galileo, these lines appeared single. When you look at them in close-up, say through the more detailed pictures of Galileo, we see them as double. Now, the reason for this seems to be that we're looking at a place where water or a liquid has come up through a crack in the surface, flowed outwards and uh, re-solidified or frozen. And what we're looking at is probably a kind of a levee. And the levees or the cracks are in the order of four to five hundred feet across. Jupiter only ever sees one side of Europa. This is because the moon takes the same amount of time to rotate as it does to orbit Jupiter about three and a half Earth days. Europa may also hold our solar system's biggest surprise, life. Not on its surface, but 60 miles beneath. As on Earth, there may be warm oceans with volcanic vents where creatures cluster around feeding on the nutrients. Surely, the next spacecraft to Europa should carry a tiny robotic submarine. Several missions have been proposed, but only one, the Europa Orbiter, has been funded so far. This flyby will use a radar sounder and other instruments to measure and map the surface and interior of the moon. The Europa Orbiter may pave the way for